This morning, we're going to be looking at Luke chapter 15. Actually, we're going to look at Luke 15 this evening as well. Uh, in this chapter are three parables that Jesus told to address the attitude of the scribes and Pharisees towards the tax collectors and sinners that were all gathering around Jesus in order to hear what he had to say about the kingdom of heaven. Now, all three of these were actually given to address the attitude of the scribes and the Pharisees, but in doing that, it also tells us what Jesus' attitude is toward these things. Now, as I've said, there's three parables. The parable of the lost sheep, the parable of the lost coin, and the prodigal son. We're going to look at the first two of these parables of this morning, so those are the two I'm going to read as uh, we begin. Luke 15, beginning in verse 1. Now all the tax collectors and the sinners were coming near to him or near him to listen to him. Both the Pharisees and the scribes began to grumble, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. So he told them this parable, saying, What man among you, if he has a hundred sheep and has lost one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the open pasture and go after the one which is lost until he finds it? When he is found it, he lays it on his shoulders, rejoicing. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and his neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep which was lost. I tell you that in the same way, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over ninety-nine righteous persons who need no repentance. Or what woman, if she has ten silver coins and loses one coin, does not light a lamp and sweep the house and search carefully until she finds it. When she has found it, she calls together her friends and neighbors, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the coin which I had lost. In the same way I tell you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. Well, may the Lord bless his word to our hearing again this morning. Now, as I've already mentioned, this morning we're going to just back up a bit, sort of zoom out, you know, from uh, sometimes we descend into the forest and we examine the trees and sometimes we ascend above the forest and kind of look at the forest to get the larger picture. And that's what we want to do this morning to remind ourselves what we're doing is really all about, why the Lord actually saved us, why he wants us to be discipled what his goal really is. Again, sometimes we get caught up in the details and we miss the big picture. Well, here's a bit of that big picture. We know the Lord saved us for several reasons, all of which are good. Uh, he saved us, first of all, because he's good. It's his nature to be gracious. And I want to just say that's the only reason why we're here this morning is because God is gracious. It's the only reason we have such a glorious future to be in heaven if we have trusted the Lord Jesus if we received him as our Lord and Savior, it's because of God's goodness. Out of his mercy and his grace, he has given us his son. There's a price that is, well, is priceless, invaluable, and something we obviously didn't deserve. What we deserve was punishment. But through Jesus, he's given us life. Now, he saved us also because he wanted to show the whole world how good he actually is. He wanted to put us on display. You know, we are uh, basically a prize. We are like trophies of His grace. We are those who are supposed to demonstrate what the grace of God does in the lives of those who possess it. Here are those that were, like the rest of the world, headed towards hell, which is the just penalty for our sins, but the Lord had mercy upon us, and He wants the world to see that. Uh, so we are to be witnesses in that sense. Now, we know that he saved us by the Lord Jesus Christ, by his son, by giving us a son, because this is the only way that he could have done this. Our Savior, as we know, had to be a man because we owed the debt. He had to become one with us to pay that debt on our behalf. But he also had to be God so that the payment that he made would be valuable enough to pay that debt. And that's exactly who he is and what he has done. But the Father also saved us in order to give us to His Son as a reward for His work. Jesus laid down His life for us. He gave Himself for us, and now He receives us. As we saw last week, we are His flock, 
He is our shepherd. We are his brothers and sisters, you know, uh, joint heirs with him of the kingdom of heaven, which he gladly gives to us. He's the one who earns it. He gives it to us. And more intimately, we are his bride. We are his wife throughout all eternity. Why did the Lord save us? Well, he saved us for all of these reasons. But there are other questions that we can ask, again, that help us better understand why he saved us. Why did the Lord, after, well, in, in saving us, give us his spirit? Why did he give us his word? Why does he call us together to worship him? Why does he want us to hear a sermon? You know, why does he want the word of God to be read and explained and applied? What's the purpose behind all of this? Well, it's because of the other goals that he has as well. Remember the Lord saved us that we might become like his son. That's what it means to be transformed into the image of Jesus. Paul writes in Romans 8 verse 29, For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to become conformed to the image of his son so that he would be the firstborn among many brethren. Firstborn meaning having the place of preeminence. He would be the greatest in this family, but he would be among those who are like him. We are predestined, predetermined to become like Jesus, and that happens in this world, and it happens through these means of discipleship. Uh, he also calls us together and to be taught uh, so that we might help each other to become more like his son. You know, we saw that, I think, last week when we were looking at the analogy of a body. Jesus is the head. We are the body, the members of his body, and as members of the body, we need to be ministering to one another to help one another become more like Jesus. Ephesians 4, 15 and 16. Paul writes, but speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in all aspects into him who is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body being fitted and held together by what every joint supplies, according to the proper working of each individual part, causes the growth of the body for the building up of itself in love. We meet together so that we might together grow more into the image of Jesus, grow into all aspects, into Him who is the head. And we meet together so that He might prepare us for our heavenly home. Uh, David writes in Psalm 5, verses 4 and 5, For you are not a God who takes pleasure in wickedness. No evil dwells with you. The boastful shall not stand before your eyes. You hate all who do iniquity. David says, God will not have sinners in his presence. So one of the reasons why we're gathered together and one of the reasons why we're discipled is to prepare us for heaven by weaning us from the world and world likeness and making us more like Jesus and in that way also making us grow in our desire to be with him in heaven. Remember the one thing that's that's true about all the children of God is that we love the world less and less and we love the kingdom of heaven and uh, the eternal kingdom of heaven more and more so we turn our back on the world and we go that direction. So this is to prepare us for heaven. But getting to the point here, it's also that he might use us to reach out to others, that we might be prepared to serve him in this world as his body, to shine the light of the gospel as his lampstands, which he has lit with the truth and with the Spirit of God, so that we can help others find their way to heaven as well. Now, thankfully, somebody did that for us, right? And we are to do that for others. Now, let me just draw your attention to something that's really quite obvious. That is exactly what Jesus did. His whole life from the very beginning of his ministry to the very end, at least, you know, up to the cross and even after that, he was still working in some sense in this way. His whole life was given to reaching the lost with the gospel and taking those that were given to him by the Father, those who actually trusted him, and discipling them so that they could carry on his work. He did that before he went to the cross, and after he rose again from the dead, he continued to train his disciples. And of course, after he ascended to heaven and gave these orders that we saw a little bit earlier, that's exactly what the disciples 
didn't. They went out and continued the work that Jesus was doing. Remember the, the book of Acts, which is the, the works of Luke, chapter 2, is really the continuing Acts. He said, in the first account, Theophilus, I told you what Jesus began to do and teach, but this account is what He continues to do and teach through His disciples. Now, if we are to grow into that image, into His image, that has to be a part of our lives. That has to be what we should be doing. And let me just mention that we are never more like Jesus than when we are reaching out to somebody with the gospel. And, you know, I think we also never experience the life of Jesus any more than when we're actually doing that. We sense the Spirit of God working in us because right at that moment we are fulfilling what it is that Jesus actually saved us to do. So today let's focus on the importance of reaching the lost. This morning we're going to look at these first two parables, the parable of the lost sheep and the lost coin, and this evening we're going to look at the parable of the prodigal son. So first of all, let's consider the parable of the lost sheep. <clears throat> now all three of these, as I've already mentioned, were taught by Jesus in response to the criticisms of the scribes and Pharisees. They were criticizing Him because He was ministering to tax collectors and sinners. We read in verses 1 and 2 of Luke 15, Now all the tax collectors and the sinners were coming near to, to listen to Him. Both the scribes, or the Pharisees and the scribes, began to grumble, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. You see, if it had been them, they'd say, Get away, you know, get out of here. We don't want you around here. But Jesus was receiving them. Jesus was teaching them. Now, the scribes and the Pharisees hated these two groups of people, the tax collectors, because they were collecting taxes. <laughs> we, you know how you feel about folks from the IRS? Well, it would be a little bit different. I mean, the IRS has the right to collect taxes. We know that. We need to pay those taxes. But in this case, it was a little bit different because these tax collectors were Jewish. They were collecting taxes for the Romans, who were basically the enemies of the Jews, and these tax collectors very often, if not most of the time, collected more than they should collect so that they could pad their own pockets. The scribes and the Pharisees hated tax collectors. The sinners were, well, the word sinner here means either Gentiles or it refers to those Jews who were just the opposite of the Pharisees who had no respect for the law and didn't keep it. Now, in this case, that's what Jesus is talking about, or what Luke is referring to as the sinner. These are the lawless Jews. Now, the scribes, remember, they were the experts in the law. They were the ones whose work it was to copy the Scriptures, and they became experts. They knew the law of God. They'd look at these people and say, you guys are breaking it all over the place, and so they despised them. And the Pharisees, who were the Jewish religious leaders, they prized themselves or prided themselves on being examples of obedience to the law and teachers of the law, and here were the people who were breaking them the most, and so they hated them as well. Now, we know from what Jesus said about the, tax, well, the, the Pharisee and the tax collector that went into the temple to pray, that these Pharisees and scribes were not looking at themselves the way they should be because if they would or if they were looking at themselves and seeing themselves as they should, they wouldn't have looked down at these other people because they were just the same, if not worse. They may have said they loved the law, but they weren't keeping it either. Now, all three of these parables also, I mean, they're, they're given to address the situation, but they're also revolving around a central message that is meant to reprove them, and that is that the Lord is concerned about the saving of what is lost and the rejoicing that this brings among those who are part of it on earth as well as those who are in heaven. Each of these has to do with that, but each of these also has a unique message. So we're going to look at them individually. Let me just mention, the parable of the lost sheep, we'll spend you know, the most of the time on this, and then we'll look briefly at the parable of the lost coin. So first of all, the parable of the lost sheep. Let's read it again. It's just a few verses long in Luke 15, verses 3 through 7. Luke writes, so he told them this parable, saying, what man among you, if he has a hundred sheep and has lost one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the open pasture and go after the one which is lost until he finds it? 
When he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders, rejoicing. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep which was lost. I tell you that in the same way, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. Now, what is Jesus saying in this parable? Well, first of all, he is telling us, quite obviously, that we need to place the priority, as you know, they did as well, but we do, on the sheep that are in danger rather than those sheep which are safe. I mean, Jesus basically asked the scribes and the Pharisees, appealing to their common sense. If you had 100 sheep and one of them strayed, wouldn't you leave the 99 and, and go find that one? Well, they would agree if you're talking about sheep, but apparently they didn't agree when it came to people because they were leaving these other people completely untouched. They wanted nothing to do with them. Now, they thought themselves to be safe and that these sinners were lost. They knew that, but they refused to reach out to them. And they were faulting Jesus for reaching out to them. They actually thought Jesus shouldn't be spending his time with sinners. He should be spending his time with the righteous. He should be spending time with us, you know, and, but yet they didn't want that either because they knew Jesus also shone the light and spoke the truth. Jesus is rebuking them for their lack of concern, especially when you consider that these scribes and Pharisees were actually the leaders of Israel. They were the shepherds of Israel, but they were not good shepherds. They just wanted to benefit from the sheep. They did not want to serve the sheep. Now, Jesus calls us, you know, in comparing these two different examples, the example of Jesus and the example of the scribes and Pharisees, Jesus is telling us as his church that he wants us to have his attitude. He wants us to be like him. He wants us to have a concern for the lost. Remember, before he left for heaven, he entrusted this work to his disciples. They were faithful in their day. Read the book of Acts. They reached out to people. They shook the earth with the gospel. Well, the Lord tells us we need to be faithful in, in our day with the gospel as well. Now, the Lord calls us together to worship. We do need to spend time with the 99, as it were, the righteous. We need to meet with one another, minister to one another. But we need to remember and not forget, as those who really are safe in the kingdom of heaven, that there are those who are not safe. They're still out there. And we need to reach out to them in mercy. And Jesus tells us we need to make them a priority. They're more important than those who are safe because they're still in danger. Now, secondly, Jesus tells us in this parable that we should search for these lost sheep until we find them. Uh, he says in, again in verse 4, What man among you, if he has a hundred sheep and has lost one of them, does not leave the 99 sheep in the open pasture and go after the one which is lost until he finds it. Now, there's a little bit of uh, ambiguity here because sometimes I think we look at this parable and we think this is really talking about a group of believers and one of them goes astray and we know who that person is and then we, we go out to try to bring that person in and we keep trying until we finally succeed. So we know who that person is, we know who it is we need to be trying to reach. But that's not what Jesus is talking about here. He's, he's addressing this to the scribes and Pharisees who are the 99 who, quote, unquote, don't need repentance. They're already righteous, but they're not really. That's just the way they view themselves. The one is representing the sinners and the tax collectors and everybody else who is lost. They're the ones who need to be sought after. They are the ones who need to be searched for until they're found. Now, how do you go about doing that? If you don't know exactly who they are, well, if they're not in a church, they're a candidate. If they're not professing Christ, they're a candidate. How did Jesus go out and find his lost sheep? Well, he went out and he preached the gospel to everyone that he saw. And how did he know that he had found that lost sheep? Well, he knew when that person came to him in faith and repentance and began to follow him. He said on one occasion in John 6, verse 37, all that the Father gives me will come to me. And the one who comes to me, I will certainly not cast out. 
which means as Jesus would go out and preach, he knew there would be a lot of people who would be upset and wouldn't receive him, but there would be those people who would come, and those are the ones the Father had given him. They will come to me. Now, applying this to us, we also need to go out and share that message. You know, think about the parable of the sower. He has his bag of seed, and he, he sows that seed where he goes, and it falls on different soil. We need to have the bag of seed, and we need to be sowing that seed. We need to be sharing that message with the people we come in contact with, people in our families, friends, uh, neighbors, uh, people that we don't know in the workplace or people we do know in the workplace, people that we run into wherever they may be. Uh, you may have heard me say in, in the prayer about uh, that gentleman who sh basically shared the gospel with everybody he saw. Um, that should be our goal, to be like that. Maybe have a tract on hand we can give to them, and, you know, but, uh, but build a relationship first because we have to build that bridge in order to cross over to share the gospel. It, you know, just cold sharing isn't, isn't terribly effective. But that we would have such a heart to do that, that's going the right direction. But try to build any kind of relationship that you can share the gospel with. We will know when they're found by when they come to Jesus and begin to follow Him. Remember what Jesus says in John 10, verse 27. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. How do you know if a person is a Christian or not? It's not just because they say they are. It's not just because they pray to prayer. It's not just because they go to church. But it's because they're following Jesus. They're becoming more like Jesus, which is what we've been looking at over the past several weeks becoming more like Him this morning, particularly by reaching out to others. But that whole character of Jesus is what needs to be developing in our lives. When we see that, then we know that we've truly trusted in Jesus. When we see it in others, then we, we know that they have trusted Jesus as well, though we could be mistaken, right, because we can't see the heart. But that's how we, we judge by the way they live. Um, but if we see somebody not following Jesus, not growing in His image, not really being concerned about what He says in His Word and so forth, then we, we come to the conclusion they must really not know Jesus, and they're one of the lost sheep that needs to be found. Now, remember, as we go out and as we share the gospel, they may not come necessarily right away. They may need to hear the gospel several times. As long as they're willing to listen to us, we need to be willing to tell them until they either come to Jesus or they make it clear they're not going to listen to us anymore. There does come a point where things like that happen. If somebody gets angry at you and spits on you, well, then, you know, you're, you're going to say, well, this person apparently doesn't want to hear the gospel. And Jesus tells us what to do when that happens in, in Matthew 7, verse 6. He says, do not give what is holy to dogs and do not throw your pearls before swine, or they will trample them under their feet and turn and tear you to pieces. And I think it's generally accepted that what Jesus has in mind here is the gospel. Don't continue to offer the gospel to somebody who's just going to spit in your face and is going to blaspheme Jesus every time you do it. The Lord may yet have mercy on them, but as far as continuing to offer the gospel to somebody like that, the Lord tells us there are cases where you shake the dust off your feet and you move on to somebody else who will listen. There's a lot of people out there Okay, so we need to, to move on. Jesus told his disciples when they went out and preached the gospel in a village, if they don't receive you there, shake the dust off your feet as a testimony against them. Move on to the next one because there's a lot of people out there who need to hear this gospel and there's only a few who actually have it. Now, thirdly, Jesus tells us that we should rejoice when a lost sheep is found. He says that in verses 5 and 6. When he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders rejoicing, and when he comes home, he calls together his friends and his neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I found my sheep which was lost. Now, every sheep is valuable to Jesus. And if an earthly shepherd rejoiced when he found his lost sheep, how much more does the good shepherd rejoice when he finds one of his lost sheep? But we need to rejoice as well. And that rejoicing comes from the fact that we also care about the people that are out there. We're concerned about their well-being. And when they are brought safely into the kingdom, it makes us happy because they're safe. So we need to, to go out and we need to search for them. And when we find them, when they're found by the Lord, 
we should rejoice together that the Lord has brought another one of his sheep safely home. Now, one thing that helps us do this is the fourth point where Jesus tells us that when one of these sheep is found, all of heaven rejoices. Heaven rejoices when a, a sinner, you know, who is on his way to perdition is actually rescued. That includes the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, the angels, and the saints who have already been saved by the grace of Christ who are in heaven. Somehow they're, they're aware. I mean, we know the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit are aware. Uh, the angels, we might be more, you know, uh, likely to think that they know what's going on, but the saints, somehow the saints also rejoice. Maybe it's because of the rejoicing of those around them. Somebody else has been brought into the kingdom. There's a celebration that takes place in heaven. Jesus says in verse 7, I tell you that in the same way there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. Now, you know, heaven rejoiced when we were found, and heaven still is rejoicing over us, but there is a sense when they rejoice even more when someone, who, when someone is brought into the kingdom of heaven who wasn't there before. Now, remember, the 99 in this parable are really referring to the scribes and the Pharisees who thought they were safe. Jesus is basically saying that heaven is going to rejoice more over one of these sinners, one of these tax collectors and sinners that repents than all of you self-righteous people here who think you don't need any repentance. The Lord rejoices in sound, genuine conversion and salvation of the lost. And then finally, with regard to this parable, let's not forget that Jesus told this parable to the Jewish leaders because of the way they were looking down on these other people, on these lost souls. They thought Jesus should dismiss them and get out of their, out of their presence. They're unclean, and we don't want to be around them either. They thought they were righteous. These others were sinners, and what they didn't see is that they were all sinners. Now, the Bible says that we have all sinned. We've all fallen short of the glory of God. That salvation isn't given to us because we deserve it. It's a gift of His grace, something we do not deserve. And that's why it's received by faith alone. Now, I think we're in a much better position to offer this grace to other people when we remember that that was our situation as well. We were like them. We were lost. We were in bondage to sin. We were on our way to hell. But the Lord saved us. That should give us a measure of compassion towards them. And you know, the thing is, they need to see that they're in danger as well, and certainly the tax collectors and sinners were more apt to see that than these self-righteous scribes and Pharisees. When you see that you're a sinner, when you see that you fall short of the glory of God, that you're under the condemnation of death, you're in a much better position to receive the Lord and His mercy than you are if you're a self-righteous Pharisee who thinks everything's okay, I've, I'm good enough for God to accept. Again, I would draw your attention to the Pharisee and the tax collector and what they had to say in their prayers. But what we read in, in Matthew 9, 10 through 13 brings this out. It, it may be a parallel passage dealing with the same thing, but notice what he says here. Then it happened as Jesus was reclining at the table in the house, behold, many tax collectors and sinners came and were dining with Jesus and his disciples. When the Pharisees saw this, they said to his disciples, why is your teacher eating with the tax collectors and sinners? But when Jesus heard this, he said, it is not those who are healthy who need a physician, but those who are sick. But go and learn what this means. I desire compassion and not sacrifice, for I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners. Again, those who are sick, who see that they're sinners, know that they need the Savior, and so they come to the physician. The people who think that they're well don't go to the doctor because they don't think they need him. Well, that's exactly where the scribes and Pharisees were, but those who knew they needed the physician are willing to go to the physician. They are the ones who see themselves as sinners and not as righteous. Now, that's what the parable of the lost sheep tells us. And, and I just want to say a few words about the parable of the lost coin because there is one other thing in here that I thought was, was very encouraging. First of all, it is essentially the same as the previous parable. It was given to emphasize the same truths. 
Uh, sometimes different pictures, different perspectives can help shed more light and give greater clarity to truths. So let me just read it again briefly, and we'll, then we'll look at it briefly. Luke 15, verses 8 through 10. Or what woman, if she has ten coins and loses one coin, does not light a lamp and sweep the house and search carefully until she finds it? When she has found it, she calls together her friends and neighbors, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the coin which I had lost. In the same way, I tell you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. Now, very quickly, notice again, something valuable is lost. Careful search is made until it's found. And when it's found, there is rejoicing. The one thing that I see here that differs perhaps a bit is that the angels are singled out as those who are the ones rejoicing in heaven over the salvation of this lost individual. Now, the angels were actually originally created by God during the creation week. I think the very first thing that he made, because we read, I think it's in Job, that the sons of God rejoiced when the foundations of the world were laid. So they witness the creation of the world. Uh, they also um, uh, are witnesses to his continuing work of salvation. They saw mankind fall into sin. As a matter of fact, uh, Paul makes reference to that in 1 Corinthians 11 as, as one of the reasons why we shouldn't usurp authority and how the angels are watching us to see what we're doing and so forth. But they are like this grand audience that the Lord has made to see what he's doing among the sons of men, how he's sent his son to become one of them, one of us, and to save us. And along the way, they rejoice, as we've already seen, over the salvation of these individuals. But why do they rejoice in particular? Well, I think it's because of the main reason why the Lord made the angels. He didn't make them just to be witnesses of all these things. He made them to be participants, just like he makes us to be participants in the kingdom of heaven. The author to the Hebrews tells us, I think this is Hebrews 1, forgot to put the reference in, in verse um, 10 or 13, it says, Are they not all ministering spirits sent out to render service for the sake of those who will inherit salvation? That's what they are. That's why the angels were made, so that they could serve us. Now, when the lost sheep or the lost coin is found... When a sinner is brought to faith and repentance, they rejoice because their Lord is glorified and because they can serve him. They can participate in this work by serving that sinner, which has now been brought into the kingdom of heaven. Because as soon as he's brought in, and perhaps even beforehand, they are serving those who inherit salvation. And I think there's a lesson in that for us. We were made for a purpose as well. We were made to become like Jesus. We were made that we might continue his work of bringing home his lost sheep. Uh, that's a privilege that has been given to us. You know, it's not given to the angels. The angels serve us, but the angels do not bring the gospel to us. We are the ones who have been tasked with bringing the gospel to others. Now, when the angels serve those who are saved, they fulfill the reason for which they were created. And when we share the gospel, we fulfill the reason that the Lord actually made us. And that should make us rejoice as well when we do what the Lord has called us to do. Like I say, there is never a time in our Christian life when we are more like Jesus than we are when we are sharing the gospel with someone else. So let's be encouraged through this to be concerned for the lost, uh, whoever they may be, whatever walk of life, never to look down on anyone. You know, any human being is made in the image of God, and the Lord wants us to reach out to them. So let's remember to be concerned for them. Let's remember to search for them, uh, you know, by sharing the gospel with them until, by God's grace, they are brought safely into the kingdom. And then when they are brought in, let's rejoice, along with heaven, that they are safe now from hell, and will be with us forever in glory. Well, may the Lord encourage uh, all of us through these. Uh, this evening, as I've said, there's further encouragements in the parable of the uh, prodigal son. 
So um, hopefully you'll be able to return for that this evening. Let's spend just now a moment in prayer and ask the Lord uh, to apply this to us. And then um, after we're done, I'll, I'll just say a few words about the Lord's Supper and we'll prepare to, to celebrate that.